All right. Thank you everybody for joining us for our Juneteenth program as we celebrate National Freedom Day. And before I continue, I would like to welcome our Secretary of the District of Columbia, Ms. Kimberly Bassett. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us on one of our many Juneteenth um, celebratory events. I want to thank you, Dr. Lopez, for putting this together. And I'm also really excited to hear what Dr. Preston has to say. Um, I'd like to all ask you to join us on Monday on Black Lives Matter Plaza. There's going to be a huge event um, with music and food and um, we're doing a tribute to HBCUs, even the Black Panther. So please come out and thanks so much, everyone. Bye bye. Dr. Matthews, you're on mute. I'm, of course, I'm muted. Thank you, Secretary. <laughs> and before I uh, continue on to Dr. Preston, um, I would just like to thank you all for joining us. Um, the celebration of Juneteenth as National Freedom Day is really just another example or another day where we can highlight the success of Black people in America, highlight the history of Black Americans and our contribution to this country, particularly in the period since uh, the end of the institution of slavery. And so I'm really excited to be here and really excited to have our presenter with us today because she is a former student of mine at Howard University. And she is going to speak on a great topic that should be very interesting to you. And I'm going to read her bio so I don't miss anything. And so Dr. Ashley Robertson Preston is an author, curator, and assistant professor of history at Howard University. Her past positions include serving as director of the Mary McLeod Bethune Foundation, National Historic Landmark at Bethune-Cookman University, while she was also an archives technician for the National Archives for Black Women's History at the Mary McLeod Bethune Council House National Historic Site. She is the author of Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida, bringing social justice to the Sunshine State, which examines how the educator rose to prominence while fighting for equality at the height of racial unrest in the state. Dr. Preston's second book, Mary McLeod Bethune, the Pan-Africanist, published with the University Press of Florida, examines the international activism of Bethune. She has published articles in the Journal of Negro Education, Journal of Black Studies, Journal of African-American History. Dr. Preston's research interests focus on the activism of Black women during the early 20th century and the ways in which they uplifted their communities, created institutions, and stood against systemic racism. In addition to her work as a historian, she is also the founder of the nonprofit Carter G. Cares, inspired by her son, who was born prematurely at 28 weeks. The organization raises awareness and provides support for NICU families and high-risk mothers. And so with that, I am excited to present to you, Dr. Ashley Robertson Preston. Good evening. Thank you all so much uh, for having me. Um, thank you, Secretary Bassett, um, Dr. Matthews, um, DC government. I'm appreciative um, to be here to speak about uh, freedom and how Black women uh, really made good, um, challenged America to make good on the promise of freedom in the nation's capital. And so when we think about freedom in Juneteenth and this uh, major celebration, oftentimes we think about it as something that occur on one day. Um, but when we look at the history of African-Americans, when we use this phrase, the struggle continues, Truly, the struggle continues. The struggle continued even after the ending of slavery. The struggle for true freedom continued through the work of um, these Black women. And so, um, Dr. Matthews, if you would help me with the, the presentation, I want to go ahead and go into that. Okay. 
So when we look, when we talk about club women, when we talk about these different organizations, um, you can go to the first slide. The National Association of Colored Women automatically comes to mind as one of the <clears throat> earlier um, Black women's organizations as far as clubs. Um, when we look at organizations like the Divine Nine, um, we think about many of the Divine Nine organizations celebrating over 100 years recently or almost 100 years, just about 100 years. Um, the National Association of Colored Women started before the Divine Nine. So it's one of the early Black women's organizations and it starts right in Washington, D.C. Um, D.C. is very much a center of power. And so you have these two organizations um, who really come together uh, with the idea that they will merge and that they will protect the image of African-American women um, and that they will go out into their communities as one. But they start this in Washington, D.C. Um, July 21st, 1896, in Washington, D.C. at the 19th Baptist Street Church, the Colored Women's League of Washington and the National Federation of Afro-American Women, they merged to form the Association of Colored Women. As you see this flag, um, this banner, which is um, a part of the collection at NAMAC, um, the National Museum of African-American History and Culture, you see the motto, lifting as we climb. And this is such an important phrase um, because if, of course, it is the motto of the National Association of Colored Women, but overall, this represents an important ideology in the Black community. Um, even when we look at the idea of the talented 10th, um, which we see Du Bois really promoting, um, this talented 10th is not supposed to just rise and forget everyone else. As you are climbing, you are also lifting others. And so when the uh, National Association of Colored Women, when they come together in 1896 in Washington, D.C., they're meeting in D.C. because it is a center of power, but they are bringing women together from throughout the nation. Um, they are bringing women together um, like Josephine Yates, um, poet and abolitionist Frances Harper, um, Miss Ida B. Wells. Um, this is a self-help organization. And so many of these women have been doing this work in their communities, but they are coming together as one. Within um, the first 20 years of the organization, um, by 1914, they had nearly 100,000 members. The departments included rescue work, mothers' meetings, kindergartens, professional women, business women, and temperance. And so the goals and the missions were set, and then you have local chapters throughout the nation, but all of this starts in Washington, D.C. So D.C. becomes an important space for organizing and building coalitions. These women come from around the nation to put together NACW, and ultimately they lay the foundation for Black women as activists. Um, these women are already leaders in their community, but in D.C. they set the agenda for their national reach. Um, so it's just important to focus on this being a space of power and African-Americans attempting to access some of that power by establishing these headquarters in Washington, D.C. And so even now we continue to see the work and involvement of the NACW in this century as their headquarters still stands on R Street. So this is a modern picture of the NACW headquarters. And so when we look at some of the amazing women that come through the NACW, um, you have Frances Harper, Margaret Murray Washington, uh, the third wife of Booker T. Washington, uh, Miss Ida B. Wells, Miss Mary Church Terrell, who uh, became the organization's first president. And so we see many of these names um, in history, um, but they are also involved in the NACW. Next slide, please. And so when we look at the struggle for suffrage, um, as we uh, celebrated um, 100 years of um, suffrage uh, for women, 
uh, recently. Well, it feels like it was recently, but as we celebrated that, um, I was always very careful to lift the name of Dr. Rosalind Turborg Penn, uh, one of the first scholars to really point out Black women's involvement in the suffrage movement. Um, when we look at suffrage overall, it's very unique for African-American women um, because they are doing all of these different things, right? Um, as I just talked about the NACW, they are also building kindergarten uh, programs um, throughout the nation, trying to educate children. Um, they are also uh, creating spaces where women can work and they're having these nurseries where they can look after children. I mean, there's so many things that they are t attempting to do and that they are working on. They're truly walking and what do we say, walking and chewing gum at the same time, like they're doing everything. So for Black women, suffrage was just one part of all of the different things that they were doing in their communities. And so when we look at this 1913 suffrage march, um, this is a march in which Black women are really inserting themselves into this movement, and it's happening in Washington, D.C. The march was um, a very radical effort on the part of women to get attention of lawmakers, specifically Woodrow Wilson. Um, it was on the eve of his inauguration, and you have almost 5,000 women who attended from across the nation right in Washington, D.C. However, there were specific challenges for Black women. And so I always say that um, I am a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And when I crossed Follow Six, um, I remember learning about um, the Deltas participating in the suffrage march. And I will be honest and say that at that moment, I did not realize how significant. All right, I see some sorors on the line. <laughs> but I did not realize how significant this was, you know, how radical this was for Black women, you know, women who had been unprotected, women who had experienced assault and all of these different things at the hands of white men. And so you have all of these women who are descending upon D.C. for this march, and it's dangerous for white women. So imagine that it's even more dangerous for the Black women who are participating in the march. Not only are they participating in the march and they're seeing all of these men, some of them drunken men who are out here acting crazy, but they're also facing racism from white women who don't particularly want them to participate. And so they um, despite the reluctance, despite the reluctance, Crisis Magazine noted, this is a quote, despite the reluctance of white women, black women marched. And this is from the Crisis Magazine. Um, the Crisis Magazine, of course, is the voice of the NAACP. Um, the editor at the time is W.E.B. Du Bois. And so Ida B. Wells, um, who is, of course, then a member of the, the NACW. You know, she's very well known by 1913. Um, she is a journalist. Um, you know, she's an a, a anti-lynching activist, like we all know Miss Ida B. Wells. And so even as she is a part of um, this march, she is asked not to march with the all-white Illinois delegation, although she was probably one of the more well-known uh, women who is participating in this march. And so she decides, you know, I'm going to let them go ahead and march. And she walks away. And when the march starts, she walks on into the march. Like she takes her rightful place among these white women who are telling her that she cannot walk beside them. And we also have um, Miss Mary Church Terrell, who recruits Delta Sigma Theta a very new organization has only been around for a couple of months. And you have these young girls from, these young women from Howard University who participate in this very dangerous march. And so this is a major event. It's very, um, it's very well attended by women throughout the nation. They're coming to Washington, D.C to really bring attention to the need for suffrage. And for Black women who are fighting for suffrage, you know, they see this as 
something that they can be able to use to protect their their communities. They see this as something that would be very valuable to them and not just for themselves as women, but for their communities, for their children, for the people who are coming behind them. And so they descend upon Washington, D.C. also. And it's just it's, it's just a, a, a beautiful thing that even though they were not wanted as a part of this, they decide that as the crisis magazine says, despite the reluctance, we're going to march anyway. And they, they're coming to D.C. to participate in this suffrage march. Also, I mean, I like to point out to my students a lot of times, you know, we take it for granted the ability to march on Washington now. You know, if you go down to the White House or, you know, in D.C. at any point in time, you know, you see people marching and you see people with their signs. You know, it's like you can show up and do it. It's not as hard, you know, but these people were um, really courageous because it's it's not the same as it is today in terms of um, how uh, they were able to march and what was going to happen to them, what they may have been facing by participating in this. Um, next slide, please. So a hundred years later, um, in 2013, we saw our reenactments of the suffrage march. Um, we also saw our reenactments um, throughout in various places. And so truly what took place in Washington, D.C. was significant. Um, but I think it's even more significant. What's even more significant is that some of the issues that African-American women were looking to solve with the vote some of those issues that they were looking to solve with the vote in 1913 as they were descending upon D.C. to take part in this march, some of those issues are still happening today. So again, as I talk about the promise of freedom and making good on the promise of freedom, this is a continuous struggle for the Black community. And these women are making sure that that freedom is going to come. They are not taking no for an answer. Next slide, please. And so this, uh, the, the title of this particular slide, The Battle for Historical Memory in D.C., it's interesting because, as I said just a second ago, as we talk about some of these issues as being 100 years ago, the battle for historical memory, I mean, this is something that's probably more relevant than ever at this point very moment in time, the battle for historical memory. What is going to go down in these history books in years to come? What is going to be the story that is told to the generations who are coming after us? How will they learn this information? How will they know these particular people? And so Miss Mary Church Terrell, um, she was one of the uh, loudest voices in terms of um, leading the charge in the Mammy Monument movement. And so D.C. is the home to many statues and uh, memorials and monuments, but there is one that is not here, and it's because of the work of Black activists, particularly um, uh, Black women. And so Senator Charles Stedman of South Carolina submitted Senate Bill um, 4119, Monument to Faithful Colored Mammies of the South. Um, this bill would have granted permission to the Jefferson Davis Chapter Number 1650, United Daughters of the Confederacy, to support the construction of the monument in Washington, D.C. Um, the only restrictions were that the monument could not be built on the Capitol. And so we see this quote um, that is a quote from Miss Terrell talking about um, the, uh, the, the monument and the damage that the monument would do. Um, and so we have Black women throughout the United States, Terrell being one of them. Uh, many of these women are a part of the National Association of Colored Women. You also have folks that are part of the NAACP, which Terrell, of course, is one of the founders of the NAACP, but they are 
protesting the idea of this monument. And so Black women really understood the power of images and memory. It was really important to control the narrative. Um, they had seen all of the Confederate statues that were being erected across the United States, and many times they were powerless. But this was the last straw. Um, you can remake that aspect of history, but you're not going to remake this particular part of it. And so when we look at um, the last few years, um, particularly after 2015, we see all of these Confederate statues across the United States, and we really see the challenge of removal. And I'll talk about that in a second when I talk about uh, Mrs. Bethune's statue in Statuary Hall. But when we look at, <clears throat> you know, how these women uh, were able to erect these monuments throughout the United States, you know, they put them up much more easier than they were able to come down. You know, we have cities and towns where people are literally battling to take these things down, to remove them. It's, 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 it's a major process. And not just the process of petitioning and all of those types of things, but also that financial aspect. Um, it's costing uh, millions of dollars to remove some of them. There's the issue of where they will be placed. Um, it's the issue of the cost of the new statue to replace it. And also, of course, getting people on board to do so. And so you have Terrell, the daughter of formerly enslaved parents, uh, one of the founding members of, NAA, of the uh, National Association of Colored Women and the NAACP, and the first president of NACW, she was one of the main organizers um, who is standing against this Mammy monument. You will not make a Mammy out of Black women. That is not something that is going to go down in history and be placed in Washington, D.C. And so they stand against it. Um, but you see <clears throat> Terrell in Washington, D.C., um, helping to rally many of these uh, women throughout the United States and really pressing for this not to happen. And so historical memory, when we look at D.C., when we look at all of the statues that are here, when we look at this um, presence, you know, this is very much a center of history. Uh, when you look at, you know, we take it for granted being in this area, but, you know, people take pilgrimages to Washington, D.C. to see all of these different things. And so Black women were adamant about the fact that what you would not see was a, a Mammy monument. Next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> and so on... On August 25th, 1916, Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson signed the act creating the National Park Service, a new federal bureau in the Department of Interior responsible for protecting the 35 national parks and monuments then managed by the department and those yet to be established. So the National Park Service is over 100 years old. And <clears throat> one of the first jobs that I um, was able to um I uh, received when I was in grad school and where I really got my start as a public historian was at the National Park Service in 2010, working at the Bethune home, uh, the Mayor McLeod Bethune Council House in Washington, D.C. And so in this home, I was really amazed, um, not just by the home and the Black women that I encountered, like Dr. Joy Kennard, but also some of the African-American women that I met who at that time were a part of the National Park Service. Um, Yola Dance, um, Ebony Davis, um, Dr. Ashley Jordan, Dr. Jocelyn Cole, Dr. Vedette Robinson Coleman. I met all of these women who were in National Park Service. And I had seen National Park Service beforehand, but in DC, I really saw many Black women preserving the history of these particular sites, like the Douglas home, the Bethune home, um, I saw them in action. And it was really powerful as someone who's from North Carolina and had 
never really encountered NPS. I was like, wow. And so as I began to dig even more, um, Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis, of course, my colleague, but at that time was my professor, you know, she encouraged me to go down to the Bethune home and to not only do research there, but to also volunteer. And I ended up working there and became a part of this legacy in terms of Black women in the National Park Service, particularly in Washington, D.C. Um, and so we have um, the Douglas home, the Bethune home, and I'll talk about the Bethune statue. Um, but I want to go back also to um, the women that I met, all of those uh, women that I named. And so at the time when I was at the National Park Service, um, I remember that we were preparing for um, the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Um, and so there was a lot of conversation around this idea of civil war to civil rights. And there was a lot of pushback in for some people um, to this idea of connecting the civil war to civil rights. You know, you would think that it wouldn't be that hard because there's an obvious connection. And so um, I began to see many of these African-American women um, in the National Park Service located in D.C. who are really, you know, because in D.C. they were strong in numbers, who were really pushing for this idea of civil war to civil rights. And it did happen. So, you know, when we look at these women in 2000 and something, uh, in comparison to the women that I talked about with the National Association of Colored Women, again, making good on this promise of freedom, making good on this idea of equality, making good on you know, all of the things that they know that they deserve as American citizens. And so we have these women who are part of the National Park Service who are making sure that the narrative of African-Americans, that it is correct and that it is represented and they were located in D.C. and were working at these sites. And so we have the Douglas home. You know, when we see the Douglas home now as a part of the National Park Service, um, that home, of course, was um, left to Douglas's family. Um, his wife ended up preserving it. She took out a second mortgage on it and needed help paying it off. And ultimately, it was the National Association of Colored Women who ended up um, raising money to pay the home off. The $4,000 uh, mortgage was paid off. And over the years, they renovated the home. Um, from 1918 to 1922, they raised and spent $11,000 to re restore the home and to beautify the home. Um, during Mrs. Bethune's tenure as National Association of Colored Women President, she also called on members to raise money to hire a full-time caretaker to maintain the home. And then when she was a part of the National Youth Administration working with the Roosevelts, um, she worked with Dr. Woodson to make sure that um, they were cataloging all of the items in the home. And in 1962, it became a part of the National Park Service. So these sites like the Douglas Home, you know, even before the Douglas home became a part of the National Park Service, you have Black women who are the caretakers. Um, they are looking at this site as a shrine, as a major site in which children throughout the nation, as they are coming to see everything else in Washington, D.C., that they should also see the Douglas home, that they should see this um, the efforts of this great man um, who fought for not only um, uh, freedom, but also fought for uh, women's suffrage. And so this becomes an important site um, in the Black community. And then you have the Bethune home. Um, of course, this site was uh, the headquarters for the National Council of Negro Women, an organization that Mrs. Bethune, Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune started in 1935. Um, 
from 1943 to 66, this house served as the national headquarters of NCNW, and it was also the final res residence in the nation's capital of uh, Mrs. Bethune. She lived there from 1943 to 1949. And so, the council house, and I'll talk a bit about the council house and its significance, um, but it was a site in which they are not only having these meetings for the um, organization, but it is also a place in which they are preserving the history of Black women throughout the nation. The headquarters, um, it there was damage to it. Um, in the 1960s, it remained vacant for several years. And in 1975, they began restoration. And in 1979, the Mary McLeod Bethune Memorial Museum and National Archives for Black Women's History, it opened to the public. Um, Dr. Betty Collier Thomas played a major role um, in establishing this archive. Another, um, an amazing historian. Um, and preservationist. And so we have this site before it becomes a part of the National Park Service. It's largely preserved and kept up um, and invested in by Black women who are adamant about this being an important space that will tell the story of Black women. Um, lastly, you have the Bethune statue that is in Lincoln Park. Um, this was dedicated in 1974. The Mayor McLeod Bethune Memorial in Lincoln Park was the first memorial to, Af to honor an African-American built on public land in Washington, D.C. Uh, the women of the National Council of Negro Women, particularly under the leadership of the legendary Dr. Dorothy Height, um, they raised the funds for the statue Oh my goodness, where are my notes? They were the ones who raised the funds for the statue. And so we now see that statue is still a part of, um, is still there. Um, but when we see those efforts, when we look now at Washington, D.C., and we have the Douglas home, the Bethune home, and the statue, all of which are still standing, um, it was through the efforts of Black women they had a tremendous impact on the preservation of history in D.C. and these particular sites. So, yes, we have the National Museum of African-American History and Culture, NAMAC, but before that was built, these sites have been providing critical lessons in history on the Black experience in D.C. And so, again, when you think about um, school children coming to D.C., it's a pilgrimage of sorts, and these sites assure that there is inclusion of African-American history. Next slide, please. And so there is a scholar um, by the name of Dr. Tara White, who is doing um, amazing work on Black club women and uh, their work as preservationists. Um, I would encourage you guys to look up their, uh, look up her um, articles that she has and her book that is coming soon. Um, this was really eye-opening to me, and I think it gave me a, a newfound appreciation. You know, there are some things that you know and you see them, but to see them in writing, you know, it really changes how you see these women. I mean, again, as I go back to the NACW, Black women are not only involved in the suffrage movement, they are not only um, building these kindergarten programs and these nurseries, but they're also preserving history through these historic sites in Washington, D.C. Next slide, please. And so, most recently, the Mary McLeod uh, the uh, Mrs. Bethune, Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune statue um, was placed in Statuary Hall in the United States Capitol um, last summer. And so, as I've talked earlier about, um, as I talked earlier about 
these um, statues and monuments throughout the United States, right? We see how hard it is to take many of them down. Um, but also, it's also a process to make these things happen. It was such a process to get Mrs. Bethune in Statuary Hall. Um, she um, is replacing Confederate General Edmund Curry, Kirby. She replaced, I said, I should say replaced, has replaced um, General Edmund Kirby, um, who had been representing Florida since 1922. And so this just happened um, last summer. I was a part of um, a group of people who went to um, Tallahassee, the capital of Florida, um, to speak to um, the Great Floridians Ad Hoc Committee um, for the Florida Division of Historical Resources. And this was in 2016. And <clears throat> when I went to go speak to them about Mrs. Bethune's significance, and why she deserved to be in Statuary Hall, I remember that um, there were many other people who, well, first of all, she overwhelmingly had the most votes, if I, if I remember correctly. She had the most votes from throughout the state. But the other two people that she was really up against were um, the founder of Publix. If you all know anything about Publix in Florida, it's like the most, it's the major grocery store chain, all of those things. And then um, the person who created the air conditioner, I believe. And so these are the two people that she's up against, these two white men, when she overwhelmingly has more votes than all of them. And so this was a really interesting predicament. And so to see what happened in the summer of 2022 to see that she finally uh, made her way to Washington DC after <clears throat> excuse me a process of about 7 years um people petitioning folks i remember writing having my students at Bethune Cookman to write different representatives um you know it was really a process and so now she is the first um african american to represent a state in this um, collection. Each state um, has two statues. And so she is there beside Mrs. Rosa Parks. Mrs. Rosa Parks' um, statue was commissioned by Congress. So it actually uh, wasn't commissioned by a state. And so now we have um, uh, Virginia, who has also recently voted um, to replace uh, Robert E. Lee with a statue of Barbara Johns. And so, again, this representation in the Capitol, um, it has, it started with Mrs. Bethune. It started with a woman who hails from Florida, where she lived most of her life, originally from South Carolina, but left a major impact on Washington, D.C. through her work with the National Council of Negro Women and also her work with the Roosevelt administration uh, working for the National Youth Administration. Next slide, please. And so this is just, um, uh, I'm running out of time, but this is just a little bit of information about her work in Florida. Of course, the founder of Bethune-Cookman uh, College, Bethune-Cookman University now, and um, did a lot of work with women throughout the state also. Next slide, please. And so when we look at um, her work in Washington, D.C. at 1318 Vermont Avenue, um, a, the site that I just talked about, the Bethune home, um, we have um, Dr. Ida Jones's book, Mary McLeod Bethune in Washington, D.C. And also in my book, Mary McLeod Bethune, The Pan-Africanist, I talk about the significance of this home in D.C., um, a strategic location provided that provided access to power brokers, a safe haven for African Americans and people of African descent. When we think about Washington, D.C. being segregated 
you know, where are Black people gathering? Where are ambassadors, Black ambassadors who are coming from other places who may be coming from Haiti or where, you know, Liberia, you know, they are hosting these people at the council house. They are offering space, a space for people of African descent to discuss their issues at 1318 Vermont um, Avenue. The picture that I have on the cover of Mary McLeod Bethune, the Pan-Africanist, this is an intercultural meeting in which they are inviting foreign students to the council house. This picture is taken in the council house. So this house becomes an important space in the community, an important space um, to gather and to discuss and to meet, and for some people to even stay. Um, they offer space for people who um, need lodging also in this home. Um, next slide, please. So <clears throat> a couple of, of points about her work in DC. Again, it becomes an international meeting space. Um, in 1947, she hosts students from India who visit Mrs. Bethune and the NCNW in Washington, DC. And they are also a part of their conference. Um, and then her work with Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who is her neighbor, who lives around the corner from her. She's the president of uh, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History for about 15 years. Um, and she's living here um, in DC throughout a good part of her tenure as NACW president. Of course, her work with the Roosevelt administration, um, she's of course seen here in front of the Capitol, um, but she does a lot of great things with the NYA throughout the nation, but she also works specifically with the Roosevelts to bring African-Americans, um, not just who are located in DC, but bringing black women throughout the nation into the White House for meetings with the First Lady, for meetings with political leaders. That is all happening in DC. And lastly, her work with the Women's Army Corps. Um, she becomes a special assistant to the Secretary, Se Secretary of War, and she handpicks um, Black women who take part in the Women's Army Corps, um, which started as the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Next slide, please. So, <laughs> Black women have played a critical role in the making of Washington, D.C. I mean, truly, we stand upon the shoulders of these women. When we look at um, the monuments that are located in D.C. and the ones that are not located in D.C., that did not happen. When we look at um, the role in the government um, that people are Black women and African Americans overall are playing. When we look at even our first African American president, our first African American vice president, they are standing on the shoulders of women like Mrs. Bethune, who worked with the Roosevelt administration, who was a part of the Black cabinet, who really made sure that African Americans were a part of the federal government that was a major part of the work that she did in Washington, D.C. And so we cannot forget the accomplishment, the struggles, nor the presence of Black women in D.C. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Preston. And we do uh, have some time, so I will uh, figure out how to let people speak. <laughs> if someone wants to speak. And or if there are any questions, I do have one. Uh, <clears throat> comment I wanted to make, and that was, um, what do you think really drove these women to be active and to fight the way they have. You know, one of the things that people talk about is, you know, the intense racism. And how do they, how do, what do you think drove them to continue this push, even though they faced this intense racism? So I think that all of these folks, their proximity to the institution of slavery, 
is so important. And I spent a lot of time talking about this with Mrs. Bethune, this with Dr. Woodson. I mean, hearing the stories of slavery, having a direct understanding of what it was like to not physically be free. You know, you can't take freedom for granted. You, you cannot, absolutely cannot. You know, hearing that and that push that they had from those parents and those grandparents and from Mrs. Bethune, even those brothers and sisters who had been formerly enslaved who said, hey, I remember what it was like. You have to do better than this because you have to, you know, you have to take our family to the next level because you have an incredible opportunity that we didn't start our lives with. And so I think that when we look at those folks who are born in the late 1800s, Bethune born in 1875, Woodson born in 1875, I think the proximity to the institution of slavery in terms of the years is a really important aspect that is often overlooked. Okay. That's, a, that's a good point. Um, you know, I've been seeing a lot about that monument to the faithful manhoods of the South that they wanted to put in the district. And I wonder in your research and in your work, why do you why do you think that became a figure that was acceptable to build a monument to? Because it was safe, um, because it was a fond memory for some of them. You know, I think it's just it's it's really safe. It's a safe image that takes away the radicalism of Black women. Let's forever make you into an image of a mammy. Let's, you know, I think it's almost like um, Miss Harriet Tubman. You know, people like promote the image of her being older and all of those things, but I don't see as many people posting that picture of her being really young and fierce and I was like, wow, or Miss Rosa Parks. You know, people like to paint her as really old. I think she was like maybe 40 when she was a part of the Montgomery bus boycott. And so that, you know, it's it's always, um, people always like to show someone when they feel like they don't have as much power. You know what I mean? Show that person in their prime. Show that person, you know, when they are fighting and, um, you know, in our spry and are, are, are moving and shaking. And so I think it was just a very safe image to promote. And I think it's just how they saw Black people overall as docile, as being servants, as people who were less than. Okay. So anyone in the audience with a question? Because I have questions for days. <laughs> <laughs> I could keep going. Okay, so one of the other things that you mentioned was the neighborhood that the uh, council house is in, the Bethune council house is in. And so could you tell us about that neighborhood of Black intellectuals and what that fostered? Yeah, so when you look at um, the, the Vermont Avenue neighborhood, it's of course a part of Northwest, but you also see around the corner, and I'm just going to go back to one of the transcriptions. When I was uh, working at the council house, one of the early projects that I worked on was transcribing interviews of people who knew Dr. Wilson. And so just to have a neighborhood where Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune is, and then around the corner, you have Dr. Wilson, I mean, literally in walking distance, you have two powerhouses who are such a significant part of Black history. Um, and in Dr. Uh, Jones's book, um, uh, Mayor McLeod Bethune in D.C., I don't know why that title was getting hard for me to remember, but she talked a lot about um, the, the community, the neighborhood, and I'm not uh, very well versed on all of the different neighborhoods in D.C., but what I will tell you is that Black D.C. is very small. Even now, Black D.C. is very small, and a lot of those folks are working together, um, really working together for the Black community overall, and they're in close proximity to one another. Now, we do have a question in the chat. Um, can you talk a little about the archival record for Black club women? 
And so the National Council of Negro Women really does an excellent job of um, preserving the history of um, Black women. If you go to the National Archives for Black Women's History, it's one of the only sites, one of the few sites that is dedicated solely to the preservation of Black women's history. And this is where I really became knowledgeable, not only of NCNW, but NACW. You know, they have the records there. Um, and this does not just, it's not just something that started in the 70s with Dr. Carter Thomas, but even during the tenure of Mrs. Bethune, when she is president, they are creating their own archive. You know, they are having women like um, Sue Bailey Thurman, um, Dr. Uh, Dorothy Porter, who are a part of NCNW, who are really challenging Black women to submit these items so that they can start preserving the histories um, right in D.C., right in this home. And so I think that there's definitely a need for more attention to the work of Black club women. Um, I really think that we kind of sometimes minimize the work of Black club women. It seems like it's very safe, right? But these women are doing amazing things and they are really challenging America to live up to its promises in the nation, I mean, in the, the nation's capital, but throughout the United States. That's a very good point. And uh, that's one of the things that I always think about in doing this type of work, the fact that um, people like to talk about archival silences, but when you look at our institutions or black institutions, yes. you see that they recognize the importance of their history. They recognize the importance of black women's history. I was used to work at the Moreland Springer Research Center and there are many collections related to black women's history, but then when you go to some of the larger archival meetings and conventions, they talk about, oh, the archives don't preserve the history of black women. Black women aren't there. Yes. And you say, but they are there in our own institutions. And so um, I'm glad you pointed that out. I think it's just like like suffrage, for example, for people who will say that there were not black women suffragists. Miss um, Ida B. Wells, of course, is a suffragist. But she's doing so many other things like she doesn't have the privilege of just saying I'm a suffragist. And so even with these archives, black people are preserving records in their homes. They're preserving records in their churches. You know, they are preserving records in a number of places. Think about grandma who had the Bible and all the names written and it's passed down from generations. That's a record. All right. So any other questions? I can go, go, go. All right. Well, uh, I did want to mention because it is 701, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you have a life. <laughs> but I did want to just mention before the day was over that uh, today is the anniversary of the passing of our former OPR administrator, Mr. Clarence Davis. And so I just wanted to recognize him because he upheld the DC archives for many, many, many years. And so I am someone who follows in his footsteps. And so I just wanted to uh, recognize him on this anniversary of his passing before this program ended. And even though Aisha didn't come off mute and identify herself, I would like to thank the Association for the Study of African American Life and History for co-sponsoring this program and helping to promote this program and for all of the work that they do in supporting African American history. And so, do you have anything you wanted to share, Secretary, before I brought us to a close? No, I wish um, Dr. Preston had another hour. It was so interesting. I knew a lot of it, but I thought she brought to light so much, um, so much, so many more um, interesting facts. And um, I didn't know as much about our founder, Mary Church Terrell. So that was really interesting, too. Um, so thank you so much. And we want you to come back. Hopefully you'll be able to. Yes. And thanks, everyone who's on the call. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And happy Juneteenth. Uh, take this day 
you know, National Freedom Day to remember our history and remember where we have come from. So thank you so much and have a great night. All right. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night.